So it seems like you've still got no friends available to help you shoot that masterpiece video, but you're not gonna let that stop you. Maybe you saw my previous video about how to film yourself and you're all inspired to make that next vlog, travel film, or piece of social media content, but you need to know how to take it to the next level so it's not obvious you did the whole thing by yourself. So in this video, I wanna help you solve one of the biggest problems that we face as self-filming folks, camera movement, because it's kind of hard when you're in front of the camera to be behind the camera moving it. Camera movement can make a huge difference in the expression of your shots, and it can also give the appearance of higher quality. And just like in the previous video, a lot of these tips have the potential to be helpful for pretty much anyone filming anything, so make sure to stick around even if you do have friends available. I really need to meet some people. Okay, I've got five different methods that you can use to get motion in your shots while you're filming yourself. Some of them are using specific gear and some of them are performed in post after you've already filmed. So I'm gonna give you some tips and tricks on how to get the most out of them and make sure that you don't screw them up. Starting off with one of my favorites, a motorized slider. Motorized sliders come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes from ones that fit in your pocket to ones that go halfway across the room. They allow you to get a super smooth sliding motion either from left to right, front to back, or if your slider is strong enough, up and down. When I'm out and about shooting, I like to use the Rhino Rove Pro slider because it's super lightweight and I can fit it in the front pocket on my backpack, but it does have its limitations. For example, it's only controllable through the app. There are no physical controls on the unit itself, which I don't really like, but the app does work pretty well, so it's a bit of a trade-off. Once I've got my composition set up on the slider, I go into the app and I choose how long I want the movement to be. I choose how much ramping I want, which essentially means how fast it will speed up and then slow down at the start and end respectively. And then I choose whether I want looping on or not, so it'll loop that movement back and forth. I make sure I'm recording on my camera and then I just hit start in the app and I go do whatever I was gonna do in front of the camera. I did also attach a quick release plate on the bottom of the slider, but it's also got legs so I can use it right from the ground. And I highly recommend trying that out if you have the capability. One thing that makes camera movement more impactful is something called parallax, and specifically slider shots look really nice if you include some kind of parallax effect. If you've ever been in a moving car and looked out the side window, you've definitely noticed parallax effect. Essentially, it's where the objects that are closer to you appear to be moving quicker, whereas the objects that are far away almost look like they're standing still. And the reason that I brought that up right after talking about having the slider on the ground is because you can actually use the ground as a foreground subject to give you that kind of depth and parallax effect if there's nothing else in the shot that makes sense. For example, here are two of the exact same shot, but one is with the slider on the ground and one is with it up on a tripod. You can see how much of a difference it makes to have that parallax effect using the ground as the foreground element. Not saying that the other shot doesn't work, there is still a little bit of that bush in the foreground, so you get a little bit of parallax, but the effect is significantly more pronounced when you have the slider on the ground and have that foreground element of the ground. Now, whether you want it to be more or less pronounced is totally up to you and totally up to what you need in the situation, but now you've got both of those things in your toolkit. And of course, your mileage may vary depending on which slider you have and which function functions it offers. For example, in my studio, I've got the Rhino slider with the Arc 2 pan tilt head, and I can not only slide back and forth, but I can also tilt up and down and pan left and right. Now, speaking of that Arc 2 pan tilt head, that brings us to our next form of motion, which is using a gimbal or a pan tilt head. This is another one where your experience may differ depending on which equipment you have available to you, but the idea here is to cover different axes than we did with the slider. This is the gimbal that I use most of the time. It's the DJI RS2. It's not necessarily the latest and greatest from DJI, and I know that some other gimbals that I've had in the past from Feiyutech were also able to do what I'm going to show you here. The idea here is that I can pre-program in moves into the gimbal using the tilt and pan capabilities, or any combination thereof, to move the camera around wherever I 
I might want it to go. And one of my favorite things about this specific gimbal is that while I can do it in the app, I can also do it right on the screen on the handle. All I have to do is go into the tracking mode on the gimbal, set waypoints for wherever I want the camera to stop, and I can make as many as I want to basically, so it's not just limited to a start and end point. Then I can set how long I want it to stay at each point and how long I want it to take to get between each point. If you're really keen, you can do some pretty complicated movements with this using multiple waypoints, kind of hitting your marks wherever you want to stop in front of the camera. But to be honest, most of the time, what I use it for is a nice smooth tilt up or down or to do a pan left or right. And like I mentioned before, it doesn't have to be a gimbal. It can also be a motorized pan tilt head like the Arc 2 that I have in the studio. And I could even go further combining that with the Rhino slider and get both the sliding motions as well as the pan and tilt. But the trade-off there is that it's really big, it's heavy. I definitely can't fit it in my backpack. So it's not necessarily ideal for when I'm out running and gunning. Before we dive into the next method that I call the fake follow shot, I wanna tell you about Track Club and you'll definitely thank me for it in a minute. Track Club is a music licensing platform for video creators that makes it super easy to get the perfect music for your videos. Here's a couple of things that makes them stand out. First of all, the quality of the music is fantastic. They may not have the largest library on the internet, but everything on there is great. Music that you would actually want to listen to. No cheesy telephone hold music going on here. They've also got an amazing search function and curated playlists, maybe even from some of your favorite creators, that makes it super easy to find what you're looking for. But the piece de resistance, the cherry on top of this delicious musical Sunday, is something that they call Mixlab, which allows you to remix songs right on the website to download exactly the version of that song that you need for your video. As we all have before, you find that song that's almost what you need, but you want to get rid of the guitar solo, or maybe you want to turn down the percussion, you can do that in Mixlab and download your customized version of that song. So all of that music that normally you'd have to skip over and keep searching becomes a viable option again. So if you want to get the perfect music for your videos, there's a link down in the description that will give you one month absolutely free so you can try it out and fall in love just like I did with the platform and with Mixlab. And a huge thank you to Track Club for supporting the channel and sponsoring this video. All right, moving on to the next method for getting motion in your self-filmed videos, the fake follow shot. Ideally, if you had friends available to help you film or to be the subject in your film, you could get this shot where the camera is following along at the same speed as the subject is moving. But when you're trying to film yourself by yourself, it's a little bit more difficult. One way that I've seen this done is to create an entire rig that attaches somewhere around your waist, but it holds the camera up high enough that it only shows kind of the head and shoulders in the shot. Personally, I'm not handy enough to make something like that myself. I was just trying to find an image online so I could show you what I was talking about here and I realized it's called a snorri cam rig and it's not even really that expensive. You can get them for like 200 bucks. So if you want to see me try one of these out, leave a comment down below. My slightly more minimalist method to get this done is that I attach my camera to a tripod and I keep the legs of that tripod folded in but extended. Then I either put the tripod onto my belt or I hold the tripod with both hands so that I can keep the tripod and my hands out of the frame. Basically I've just got a giant glorified selfie stick, but the idea is to try not to make it look like you're taking a selfie. Now, if you're walking along and this is a moving shot rather than just one where you're standing still, this can be a little bit tricky because it does get bumpy. So if your camera has some kind of active stabilization in it, that's great. But the other option is you can also do this with a gimbal. If you wanted, you could attach the gimbal to a tripod or you could just try and hold it with a little extension handle to get it far enough away from you that you can keep your hand again out of the shot. I will admit I've managed to get this shot from in front of me or beside me, but I haven't managed to figure out how to do it from behind yet. So bonus points if you can figure that one out. Hey, future Dunna here. I just realized I never brought up the possibility of a 360 camera on like a selfie stick for this same kind of shot. My brain just goes immediately to trying to use my big fancy cameras, but if you want to use a 360 camera, all the more power to you. 
Let's move on to the next tip. The next two tips are actually done in your editing software after you film, so we're gonna head to the studio for that. But before we do, there's something very important that you need to know about adding fake camera movements in software. When you're shooting, shoot wider than you want the shot to look in the end. When you use software to add any kind of fake camera movement, you inherently need to crop in to give yourself space to do those moves. So when you're shooting, you need to make sure that you shoot a little bit wider than you want it to be in the end to give yourself that room. And if you have the ability to shoot in a higher resolution than your final output, that's even better. For example, if you're going to output to 1080 and you can shoot in 4K so that when you crop in, you're not losing any resolution, that's great. Or if you want to output to 4K and you have 8K on your camera, do that. That being said, I punch in a little bit on 4K with a 4K output all the time and no one seems to really notice. Not even me. All right, let's head back to the studio and talk about the first fake camera movement that we're gonna learn how to do in software, handheld camera shake. You don't always necessarily want those big smooth slider or gimbal moves like we saw in the other methods. Sometimes you just want your tripod shot to look a little bit more like it was handheld by a camera operator. This kind of move gives it a little bit more of an organic feel and it can kind of lend itself to the documentary style or if you really give her with it, you can get that kind of chaos in your shot if that's what you're looking for. Now, there are two main ways that I like to do this in my workflow. In DaVinci Resolve Studio, which is the paid version of DaVinci Resolve, if we go up to effects and search for camera shake and make sure that we're under open effects, we can slap that right on this clip. It's a tripod clip where I'm looking around all worried and stuff. So we're gonna add a little bit of that fear and chaos with some camera shake. And then on the right hand side under our inspector, we've got pan amplitude, tilt amplitude, PTR speed, so pan, tilt and rotation speed. So we can mess with all of these as well as our scale and our motion blur to really get it dialed in. We can either have just a little bit or we can get it really shaking. So something like that definitely gets the point across. But the other way that you can get a really natural looking handheld camera shake is by actually filming something handheld for a little bit and then reverse stabilizing it. Let me explain. So all I've done is filmed a shot of my little Doctor Who characters here. It's handheld and you can see it's kind of shaking around all over the place. And I've placed it over top of that other clip in the timeline. Next, I'm going to highlight both of those clips, right click and choose new compound clip, or this could be a nested clip or whatever your software calls it. Give it a name. And now of course, because my shaky clip is sitting on top, that's all we can see. So what we're gonna do is go into our stabilization, whatever stabilization your software has, and just let it do its thing. So now it looks a little bit more stable. We're gonna open up that compound or nested clip in its own timeline. So in DaVinci Resolve, I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna hit open in timeline. And then I'm going to disable the clip with the shake on it. Now when I go back to my main timeline, it's still applying the stabilization to the compound clip, but because I've disabled that top layer, the one that actually was shaky, it's applying it almost like a reverse stabilization to the clip that was perfectly still. And you get a really organic, nice looking camera shake. This is literally the camera shake from my hands holding a camera. And if you wanna dial that effect up or down at all, you can go back into your other timeline, re-enable that shaky clip, go back to your main timeline, and then you can start from scratch with your stabilization. And remember, the more stabilization you do, that's gonna be more shaky in the end clip. If you dial back that stabilization, it's gonna be less shaky in the end clip. So that's handheld camera shake. And lastly, we've got a multi-part method that I'm just gonna call fake camera moves. There are a ton of different things that you can do with fake camera moves in software, including mimicking some of the moves that we saw earlier with the gimbal and the slider. It just depends on how you wanna get there. Probably the simplest and most obvious thing that you can do is just using keyframes to make those moves. So for example, I've got this shot where I'm walking away from camera and I'd like to use that motivation to slowly push in as I walk away. So all I'm gonna do is go to the start of the clip. I'm gonna go into my inspector in the top right. I'm going to add a keyframe on the zoom. And then at the end of the clip, I'm just going to zoom in, to let's say 1.2. Now, if we watch that, we've got this nice push in as I'm moving away. And 
And then if we continue that push in on this second shot to give it importance, it'll also make them kind of glued together. So again, adding that keyframe at the start and then going to the end and maybe just going into 1.1 this time. So now together we've got this. That's a nice subtle way that you can do a push in. You could also go the opposite way and pull out, or you could go side to side and kind of mimic that slider move. So for example, in this shot, I'm moving from the right side to the left side, and what I wanna do is mimic a slider moving with me. So what we're gonna have to do first is go into our inspector. We're gonna have to zoom in a little bit because we need room to push. If we move our position without zooming in, we're gonna get those black bars. I'm gonna go about 1.4. Let's give me lots of room. And then I'm gonna move over keyframe at the start of it, go to the end of it, move it over a whole bunch, and now I've got a fake slider move from right to left. It may actually be more technically like a pan than a slider move. I'm not sure exactly how that works when you do it all in post, but it's moving right to left. Now, if you wanted to dive in even further, what you could do is go into these keyframes here and you could add ease in and out and kind of smooth out the moves a little bit. So now it's gonna speed up, hit that top speed at the middle, and then back down, slows into the end. That's called easing in and out in the software, but it's the same as what we saw with the ramping on the slider. And if you wanted to take things even further with these fake camera movements, what you could do is actually follow a subject as if you were a camera person following the subject in front of you. I've got this clip on the timeline where I kind of wander around from side to side, get a little bit closer, get a little bit further away, kind of look a little bit stressed out. And what I could do is take my keyframes again, the position and the zoom, and keyframe all the different spots as I'm moving around, but DaVinci Resolve has an interesting feature called Smart Reframe that we can use in this instance as well. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna punch this in a little bit, so let's go 1.4 again, and then I'm gonna go under Smart Reframe, and I'm just gonna leave it on Auto. You can technically also give it a reference point, but I'm just gonna leave it on Auto. It's pretty smart about picking up people, so let's hit Reframe, and it's gonna go through and analyze that clip and then decide where it wants to follow along and create all those keyframes for you. So going back to the start of the clip here. So now that it's created all of our keyframes for us, we can go in again and we can dial in how we want them to land. So there was that one there that was a little bit too abrupt when it stopped. So we'll soften out that stop a little bit. It does kind of the majority of the work for you and then you just kind of have to go in and dial it in. And with that, you've got a bunch of new ways that you can add camera movement to your videos even when you're filming yourself. And then when you do eventually show them to people, they will definitely want to be friends with you and you can be like, I don't need you. Just kidding. Be nice to people. Leave a comment down below if you have any other ideas on how to add camera movement and make sure to share this video with anyone who you think might benefit from it. And if you haven't already watched my other video on how to film yourself, it's, uh, it's right there. Go watch it and uh, enjoy, make some videos. Bye.